Abe's all about the music. I'm all, you know. But you better, you gotta switch gears because we're gonna be talking visuals only. Everyone watch this movie on <laughs> mute, Only right? Visual. Yeah. No. Without uh, turn the sound. They off. don't even know what movie we're talking about yet. Today on Frame Rate, the show where we rate frames, we're talking October Sky. Octurbsky? Ivan Bakovsky. Ivan Bakovsky, may he rest in peace. The central character of October <laughs> yes. Sky. All this will make sense by the end of the episode. With me, Abe Epperson. One of my best pals mm. in the world with me. Tom Ryman. Also a pal. <laughs> <laughs> but not the best. Well, That's hey, but, less superlatives for me. Hey, but I fine. go back 15 years. You got to give yeah, it to us. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for being here again, Tom. Sure. Always happy to have you. Uh, you had not seen October Sky. No, I've never correct? seen it before. Great. Uh, yeah, you said that on the text chain. So I love when there's fresh eyes on a movie. I always want to start with that person. Can you, A, elevator pitch for the people who haven't seen it? And then be just straight first impressions. Yeah, sure. First thing on the table. It's uh, the biopic of uh, Homer Hickam, who is a real life NASA engineer. Um, he it's about him as a teenager growing up in a coal town in West Virginia. They see the Sputnik launch, and he gets inspired to build a rocket and go to space. So against his curmudgeonly father's wishes and basically the will of the entire town for some reason mm -hmm. um he and his friends work together uh to build a rocket and they wind up winning the national science fair and they all get to go to college and he becomes a nasa engineer and he reunites with his dad he does so he will get there Abe. he comes to an understanding with uh, his dad and what'd you think of it? It's good. <laughs> like we're walking out of the theater and I go, well, did you like it? It's a good movie. Yeah. yeah. It's Joe a, Johnston killing it. Fucking Joe Johnston. Chris Cooper. Uh, this is one of the few movies in a Chris Cooper run that made him my favorite actor for a while. So good. Culminating in adaptation where I was like, this that's, guy can do anything. That's yeah. he finally won. Did, he won for he won supporting. For, for that. adaptation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Chris Cooper as the curmudgeonly dad. Uh, that Abe alluded <laughs> this, to. In this, in this time period, he was playing angry dad like so often yeah, that's and true. so effectively. Cold dad. <laughs> yeah. That it was just like, man, like, just, I worry for his actual children. Yeah, just <laughs> perpetual disappointed Chris Cooper face. It does. Uh, this is one of the few true story movies where I remembered the whole time that it was a true story. I think there's something about the history of space and rocketry mm -hmm. that I like to keep in my mind. This really happened. Like hidden yeah. figures the whole time I was also like, it's so cool that this really happened. Yeah. And in October Sky, I'm like, what are the odds everything in this guy's life would be so filmic? His dad has black lung. He lives in Colwood. Yeah, like the Colwood, name of the town West is Virgi Colwood. Well, it's a, yeah, the only reason it exists, and they uh, allude, they mention it several times, is that the, I think the coal company literally owns the town. The entire town, right. Yeah. And uh, he's like, there's a scene where they're like, uh, like, I don't just want to be a dumb hick. And he's like, we are hicks. And I'm like, yeah, your name is Homer Hickam. Yeah. <laughs> like, how could this have been more perfectly crafted as a filmic life story? It's great. Do you guys know the, it's actually, I think, more common known now, but just a random tidbit, the, uh, the name of the biopic. Yeah. You read this? The name yeah. of the biopic that Homer Hickam actually wrote is Rocket Boys, is the title of it, which is in... Oh, yeah, I have Anagram. that porno. It's good. No, Rocket Boys. <laughs> yeah, it's but if, real dudes, if you dudes movie. <laughs> move all the letters, that's it's an, an, it's an anagram it's of an anagram uh, October of Sky. October Sky. Yeah. Oh. Just a nonsense, cute I, thing. This is the, and if you like, leave it to age for about 10 years, mm -hmm. it becomes a Rocket Man. Yeah. Which is <laughs> another <laughs> decent movie. It grows into a Rocket Man starring <laughs> yeah. Harlan rocket Williams. Men, oh, okay, you're yeah. right. Um, so and then if you wait dudes. even longer, it becomes Space Cowboys. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's like veal. You want it young. Yeah. It's best young. Oof, yeah. oof. <laughs> the, re the reason I knew that is because my, my roommate in my freshman year of college fucking loved this movie it was like the only dvd he owned and he told me wow. that fact wow. i didn't see the movie he just told me yeah it's an anagram of, of the title of his book <laughs> i'm like thank you for that information well, nice uh this... laura dern let's not forget oh, shit miss riley i mean up top we'd like to mention most of the everyone cast in this and, movie kills and, it. yeah everyone although this, movie. this is one of the few ones we've covered i mean because you and i love writing and directing so much i don't i didn't even look up and i like don't care do you know <laughs> 
What? <laughs> who wrote the screenplay? Who directed it? Are they it's of Joe note? Joe Johnston directed it. Joe Johnston it. directed it. Okay, that name rings a bell. Tell uh, me why he's of note. Rocketeer, what else? Uh, Captain America First Avenger. Oh, my Rocketeer joke just got retroactively better. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, also, Jurassic Park 3. Ooh! <laughs> and the Wolfman. He didn't do and Jumanji, the did he? He might have the done first Jumanji. One? Yeah, the first Jumanji. IMDB it. That's He's not our function on this well show. He's also well known <laughs> as like the right hand man of Spielberg. Yeah, he was a Spielberg oh, a second time. unit for a nice. while, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Until he got his own career. So yeah, it captures, and I think it's funny because October Sky is a much better title than Rocket Boys. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, and it captures that very Bradbury. Uh, Bradbury wrote about a lot, and I think something that was genuinely happening to the whole country or a large swath of it at this time was like realizing that we're within a lifespan's distance of humans going to space being real and being like, wow. Yeah. It's, a, it's a time I wish I was alive because it feels like now is not that time. <laughs> There's mm. no... We're, all, we're launching cars into space. I guess, but we're almost <laughs> scared of... Like the idea that technology will leapfrog ahead in my lifetime is mostly a threat or <laughs> perceived as like, yeah, a bunch of shit could go wrong then. Imagine I, hear, I think there was... Yeah. It's, this film romanticizes it. I feel like there was a lot of... That fear was very real. People That's, certainly feared Sputnik even though it was just a metal ball with a transmitter inside and yeah, nothing else. Yeah, there was else. so much yeah, like... Yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of that in the movie too. Well, I mean, yeah, theater. the only ones that... The only fiction that they have on... Like, book that they have about rockets in the town is like a fiction, like, about sci-fi. Like, he... Does he can't even get information about rockets up front? Well, that's the other half of the movie, right? Is the classic concept of the coal town owned like the John, like an old John Prine song. <laughs> no one gets out alive. Everyone keeps telling him what a great coal miner he's going to be. Older brother is the football quarterback, going to mm-hmm. get a scholarship through football. I think it's is it his very like his first sequence that we see Jake Gyllenhaal in. Is trying out for football, out for football and just team, getting yeah. pinned over just and over get, and over and over. Good. Yeah, yeah. And why uh, would you put him as a lineman? He's yeah, hundred because of his pounds. brother. <laughs> like, because of his brother. That's yeah, all. it's just a small town where you give everyone a shot. Make him like a tight end or something. Let's see if Homer can catch. Yeah, he was never good at. He's football. probably fast. <laughs> never good at football. <laughs> I think it's amazing actually that Gyllenhaal is well. Looking back on his career, it's crazy that he's this role. But it's not weird at all. He totally pulls it off. And oh, it seems yeah. Like, but I think this it. is a very Hall role. Really? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I just feel like Homer Hickam has nothing sinister inside him. No, he doesn't. He's very earnest. And Jake Gyllenhaal always has some level of sinister inside or I, brokenness I, inside. I mean, this he's is, started to do that, but I yeah. think yeah. He, he can play, because he's got, he's got kind of a goofy face. Like He can play very open and earnest. Like, this he, is he one can of his do that. first movies as well. It's not yeah. like he had choices. He was trying out for everything just to get his... Right, because I think Bubble Boy came out the year after this. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> I think Bubble Boy is underrated, but I I guess that's because I saw it 40 times on Comedy Central growing up. Well, this movie, not Bubble Boy, mm-hmm. October Sky, is we hands, might want to switch gears. To, is you know. hands down my favorite movie. Explain why. Uh, so <laughs> I watched this movie more than any other movie. It's not the best movie in terms of craft or message. Like it, there are other more grander and impressive films. But this is the one that literally put me on the path of being a filmmaker. A little Abe watching it in, I think, 1998. 99, right? 99, you know. I didn't think about being a filmmaker yet. So you guys would not know me if this movie had not gotten my life at that time. And that's just will always keep me endearing to them. Uh, it also... Now we are the rocket boys. Because it was one of the th- things that they show, like... Uh, it's science class, but we're not doing anything today. But also, this movie's good, so we're just going to put on a movie. Yeah. Like one of those days. Yeah. And I remember I was just blown away. And it was the first time I thought about, like, how, like, shots matter. And, like, we were talking about before, the shot where he descends into the coal mine, the first time that he has to actually now go and 
because of Chris Cooper's eye and his brother's got the football scholarship Mm -hmm. and he looks up and sees Sputnik again, he's literally going in the opposite direction of where he wants to go. Of his goal, right. Yeah. and Because Sputnik's directly overhead as the mine shaft elevator is descending. Mm -hmm. this movie has some sleepy, like, subtle, like, nice little nuance. Well, that shot has a second action in it I really like, which is then the guy goes, kid, you're supposed to turn turn your your helmet on. on." And as soon as he turns on the light from light pollution, the stars are all washed out now. Like, you instantly don't see the stars because you have your helmet on and you're focused on your job. I didn't notice any other ones, but that is a great shot that has meaning embedded in it. Um, I think there's meaning to... It's also just suggestion. It's there's not always necessary. emotional support in the but, t- types uh, of shots. I think the shot of... Um, she's, paint, she's painting like Myrtle Beach. The mom. A mural of Myrtle Beach, right? Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. And uh, it's Which got is... a gun and shot in it. There's a drive-by shoot shooting kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. Now, which is a symbolic thing i think for sure because that's her uh she's a very minor character in terms of how much time we spend with her right but that's her goal is to get somewhere nicer than here. yeah and elsie is also kills it in this movie yeah she's good when she like charges back up to uh chris cooper after during the union sequences Mm -hmm. where will you go i'll live in a tree if i can get away from yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. myrtle beach (laughs) and then she walks off and then chris cooper smiles I thought that was a nice touch. Like he's like, it reminded me of uh, No Country in that they actually have a very rocky marriage in October Sky, but somehow (laughs) with the little tiny interactions and acting choices and very small lines and choices like smiling at the right time, Mm -hmm. Chris Cooper's character is in such a danger of being the villain. Like, did you ever see The Way Way Back? No. Uh, where Steve Carell's like a stepdad that you just wouldn't want to be. He's just a dick. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Chris Cooper's character, as scripted, so easily could have been like, oh, that guy's an abusive father. It's good he gets out from under him. But there's these little hints, and it reminds me a lot of, in No Country, uh, Llewellyn almost barely interacts with his wife, and yet you're like, God, they love each other so much. It's accomplished so efficiently. Yeah. And I felt like, these this married couple we have cut in in media res and they're fighting almost to the where they might be getting a divorce right but and you I, can tell they love each other so much this is at the end of a long series it's of also because the town is dying so there's like financial troubles and like he's trying to strong will like chris cooper's trying to make uh it literally survive and it's taxing on it's the a, relationship it's a great uh lesson in basic screenwriting if you want a character if especially for a biopic like where you have one character's goal as the overriding goal because what really regenerates this movie sequence by sequence is a new fucking challenge like their washer melts and the guy's like oh you need steel of this quality well how do you get that no one knows they're yeah. like you need a bunch of money and you have to go ship away for it You're like this shit now yeah and even the town you live in like the principal confiscates their rockets at one point because the school's no tolerance weapon policy. Yeah, <laughs> it's just nuts what this guy has to deal with. Yeah. Also, the source music in the movie is perfect because it's all like from that era. Yeah, and the score itself is fucking fantastic. It makes it really feel authentically of this era. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, back to Chris Cooper's character real quick. You get all the, you get all the information you need about him when the, when you first meet him, somebody's he's walking up and he's like, just saved a guy. And Jill and Hall's like, that's my dad. And then he starts yelling at the guy for making the mistake that almost killed him. And then he says, right. that's my dad. <laughs> like that's, that is, that it hundred percent describes yeah. that character. <laughs> and Abe, you're right. Like there's no ostentatious craft in this or like, especially not from like the DP angle or, like the deployment of subtle uh, subtextual like symbolism and shit. But there is so much basic craft to learn. Like this is a great movie to watch for people who want to write a good solid movie where yeah. all the scene work is strong. It also, cause that's a, the one Tom just mentioned is so that's a great efficient character introduction. You're like, boom, boom, boom. Got it. Clear. And it's also a masterclass in a mode of writing. My favorite lines in the movie are, uh, here it literally happens at the same place, but late in the movie, here you met, here you met your big hero. Didn't even know it. 
talking about Werner von, von Braun. Yeah. Von, von right, Braun. so throughout the movie, and he's then, been writing to Werner von Braun and getting like fan letters back. And then he responds, look, I know you and me don't see exactly eye to eye on certain things. I mean, we didn't see eye to eye on just about every, anything. But dad, I come to believe that I got it in me to be somebody in this world. And it's not because I'm so different from you either. It's because I'm the same. You know, I can be just as hard-headed and just as tough. Uh, and then he says, which is just too much for me, uh, I only hope I can be as good a man as you are. I mean, sure, Dr. Von Braun's a great scientist, but he isn't my hero. Which is just like, oh, I'm immediately a child. Because <laughs> that's... I also cried, but I do think it's cute how much it gets you. Because it's like, yeah. if you break down the trope, it's been done before, oh, it'll be yeah. done again. It's a hard-ass dad finally being like, all right, kid, and tasseling your hair. And you're like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, it's just some things work on people. I no, just have to acknowledge it. It's the thing that a, a, lot of, a lot of us, particularly uh, being men, sure, who were once boys, I think getting mm-hmm. your father's approval is a huge right. deal. Right, and I, they also <sighs> have good I'm, lines on that, too, mm-hmm. because John Hickam, Chris Cooper, says, you don't know what the mind gives me because you're still a boy, and then later when he becomes a minor, he says he's a man. He can make a bizarre well, decision. But it's funny because he is using the logic selectively to pursue his agenda. Yeah, exactly. Because then his mom's like, he's too young to go in the mine. We have to make ends meet and keep him in school. And he's like, well, he's a man. He can choose to go in the mine. So if you choose to go in the mine, then I agree you're a man. But if yeah. you defy me, you're a boy. Yeah, if exactly. you, if you, Which yeah. is shitty dad double logic. There's, it's like, because I said so. Right. <laughs> What's, you, you fit my parameter, my definition of what it is to be a responsible adult. Right. Which is getting the goddamn mine and mm-hmm. work for your family. It's really a MAGA movie because that's what you want is you want this coal mine to stay there and you want all these people to keep dying in the coal mine. You know what I mean? Keep dying <laughs> horribly. Horrible, horrible black lung deaths. Like two of his friends have dead fathers. Yeah. And yeah. there's a great subplot where like one of the first guys, Ike Bukowski, who I alluded to in my nonsensical introduction to this episode, is the Russian guy who's sending money back home to his family who helps Jill and Hall make their first nozzle, I think, on the lathe. Yeah, he, he does the first welding for him. Which gets him in trouble in a sense, which gets him sent to the mine instead of the machine shop, but it turns out he makes more money there so that he can send home, so then he gets killed, and Jake Jill and Hall feels responsible, but the dad is like, I told him he didn't have to work there. That was his choice. Everyone makes their choice, including the cost benefit risk analysis and Mm -hmm. he did that too i think one of the reasons the impact of the trope at the end not to just diminish it to a trope but the scene at the end yeah yeah. like when the dad when the levy finally breaks i mean it's literally he's never touched his son in an affectionate way and he puts his hand around his shoulder and you're like oh god oh Mm -hmm. and they're firing a rocket together and a rocket and a giant phallic thing shoots off into the sky and everyone witnesses it and it's beautiful yeah Yeah. he's like see when me and my dad touch our peens reach to space Mm, they do and the community applauds (laughs) (laughs) look at all these people clapping for Um, our peens but i think it's the genuineness of homer hickam and the he doesn't just save the cat which in case you've somehow avoided hearing that term this whole time just means the shit you put in a movie to make people know this is the good person, you should like them, because uh, they do good things. And the classic example is the hero saving a cat from drowning, because they have no reason to. It just proves they're nice. Um, or, I guess, being in the desert and flipping a tortoise over. <laughs> what what um, desert? Why am I in a desert? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I don't understand. Tortoise. Uh, different episode, different episode. But I realize that many of the... The film is basically intercut between ingeniously solving a seemingly insurmountable problem with a combination of cleverness and just wanting it so bad. Because, like, Quentin, his nerd friend, brings a lot of the smarts. Homer brings the inspiration. Homer just wants it the most. He's just the will. (laughs) Yeah. 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 The one shot you see of Quentin's house where he's just devastatingly poor. And it's, it's, like, in that second, it's like... Because, like, he's also the outcast. They have to befriend. He's the smartest one of all. Yeah, like they wouldn't have made Homer would never have shot a rock without this kid. It's like, why isn't the movie about this guy? Yeah. <laughs> like, I think it's because if you've noticed from the postscript, he didn't become a NASA engineer. He didn't. Though. So it's like 
We didn't want to make a movie about the kid who tried and was friends with Homer Hickam and did all the same things, but then ran a car dealership for the rest of his life. Right. Which is still, hey, big step up from the dilapidated shack he was living in. But I agreed. I was like, Quentin yeah. deserves more. But the thing is, it's life. So, like, yeah. they didn't want to change it, I guess. It's not fair. Um, but it does suck that, well, they all get college scholarships. And that is a, that's a big success. I, it's not much these days, but at the time, that really could take you far. It's huge, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but Homer's the only one who actually ends up, you know, they do the Animal House postscript. Yeah, yeah. Like he his... still works in NASA to this day, I think, or has he? No, he, he doesn't. He doesn't work there. Any, I looked him up. He, okay, but he until went to recently. he went to Nam before he went to NASA. Oh, geez. Yeah, he was in the army. Oh, there's a whole nother movie in yeah, here. Yeah, he won like a couple of fucking medals. Where he like is hand building rockets in the jungle and just making real calculations. Quick, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was like an Army Corps engineer or something. Um. And then when he got out, he went to NASA. Gotcha. Um, I think now to he NASA, ri- that old track. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think now he writes books. Right. Yeah. Mostly about himself. Yeah. I imagine. He writes some fiction, too. But Yeah. Uh, Rocket boy. Rocket boy. <laughs> I make notes when I cry. Do you guys remember any other times you cried? Because I, I have many. Uh, yeah, I know exactly. You know when exactly when you cried? Yeah. Because obviously the final scene where you're supposed to cry. Do you cry at movies, Tom? Sometimes. Did this one get you? Um, I didn't cry, but I, I, you know, I felt it. I was like, the oh. choked up. Sure. Yeah. When? Hit oh, me, def- it was me. definitely the very last scene when his dad sure. shows up. Yeah, the he's not my hero scene gets me too. That one was good. The yeah. mom's monologue saying "I'll leave you" to yeah. support her son that got me. Mm-hmm. And then. Oh, I wrote, and in the, and I cried the hardest. Oh, I just, when they all get the scholarships. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, the, the epilogue hits hard, because it's like his mom retires to Myrtle Beach. It's like, oh, and then it's like John Hickam died of black lung in 75. Oh, that's like, shit. Well, we were on break before this episode. That's what you're saying is it's like, we're like, this movie really hits you right in the feels. I'm like, yeah, his dad finally loves him. And then 10 seconds later, you find out he died very shortly after that. Well, 15 years, but... Sure, but of the disease that you knew he was going to get in right. the movie. Right, well, well, he says so in the film, he's like, like coughing. What's he it got wasn't from a it, good I... 15 years. No. Right, right. No, that's a, that's a bad black lung. But at the same time, thing. you can respect, obviously, because he saves people's lives, but also I think it's easy to understand his obsession with the mind. Mm. Um and how it's been this intergenerational thing, even though he's totally wrong and he's basically an antagonist to our hero's challenge. I love how they rode that line of not making him an asshole. Like, I fully understand why he thinks you're being crazy. The Rockets are not going to pay for your life. Are you kidding me? Well, like, you're going to be living with Quentin in the, on the uh, wrong side of the tracks in ro- West Virginia. Rocket I- science was like... Like Abe was pointing out, they only have one book and it's fiction. It was it was like barely a thing. So it's like yeah. it's 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 easy to forget that like a kid trying to apply himself to learn science to do like aeronautical engineering or something, like in the fifties in the South, like yeah. in, in a poor like West Virginia is one of the poorest states. Um it's like you might as well be saying, I'm going to go be king. It's or like, now, yeah, be born in a trailer park and be like, I'm right. going to invent fully immersive VR pods. That's sure. What I'm gonna yeah, do. Like, <laughs> so, like a technology that's like so beyond what people you, have. It's like, what are you ta- You? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make rockets. Oh, yeah. I want to go into space. It did bum me out, though, because, you know, you watch this movie and it's like he's working down in the coal mine. And this is a, a thing that people bring up a lot. Like, it's like how many you know, how many Albert Einsteins were wasted in coal mines or right. slaves or right. something where it's just yeah. like, <laughs> it's such so a many. fucking bummer. How many great minds did we waste? And I mean, just through trauma, we're yeah. getting into just like philosophy now, but like, you know what I mean? You can ruin an Albert Einstein just by abusing or molesting them. Like they don't yeah. even have to die. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Einsteins aren't that hardy on behind the bastards. Robert Evans made the great point that, Saddam Hussein went through like a wild, it might not be Saddam because he talks about a different dictator every week, but one of these horrible dictators went through a period where they were super addicted to a lot of party drugs. And then they, uh, it was Osama. It was Osama, yeah. And then he found religion, straightened out, and then killed 3,000 people and became a giant, like the world's most notorious terrorist. Right. Yeah. It's like, if I could go back in time, <laughs> I would just give him drugs and take him to parties. Like, yeah. you can totally stymie someone's life course just by, you know. 
yeah there's a, there's a lot of things so it's like it's it's uplifting to watch a person fight so hard just to have that chance to do something yeah but you know this there was part of me at the same time was like man this is this is such a one in a million thing like how many people really fight this hard and just have to go in the mine the movie I, itself highlights that you're like everyone else in the town died in the mine though like yeah. really only homer gets away right yeah another one that gets me is uh when john hickam uh sees roy lee getting the shit beat out of him oh, by yeah, his tra- stepfather and so, he says your father was yeah. one of the best men i had working for me i was lucky to know him yeah so ju- the context just being they're both in trouble for the same thing but Roy Lee's dad just starts beating him in public, and Chris Cooper saves the cat. It's a save the cat for Chris Cooper. Yeah, yeah it goes and stops, and it's like you don't do that. Also, I did it. Uh, I didn't know nerds as early as the fifties were coining their own interjections. Quentin has prodigious yeah. like that. I think period wise, algebraic because there's algebraic, there's <laughs> alphanumeric, there, yeah. but like. I think this might be the earliest time period where I've seen a nerd who says his own special thing that he says. Yeah, <laughs> and that's I also rad. love that Roy Lee tries to quote him later and where fucks he it says, up. Prodigious. Oh yeah, yeah. prodigious <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. I think that the scene where uh, John Hickam saves Roy Lee from drunken stepdad beating him up is is also a neat juxtaposition that. It, it is a save the cat moment, but it also informs the character a little bit more about, you know, they, they accuse him a few times in the film of caring more about the mind than he does about his family. And I think you see that in this because he's not kind to his son at all. He's like, I'm in, you're, this is the first time I've been embarrassed by you. Yeah. Or like, I'm ashamed of you. Like, yeah. he's, not, he's not offering any kind of support or kindness which, to his to son. Which, to be fair, because he thinks they started a massive forest yeah. fire, which is like a, a really bad thing bad, to have done. <laughs> right. But then he gets Roy Lee in the car and just... Is super nice, like nice builds to him, him up, up yeah. up, uplifts him. But while Jill and Hall has to sit there watching him do that, it's like you'll do this for the son of a man that you worked with who died, but you won't do it to your own son. Do it to your own son, yeah. yeah. No, it's a good. Uh, yeah, position. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, mm-hmm. Chris Cooper's like an even balance every scene of. I love you, son, but fucking don't cross me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you guys want to hear a cool deep cut for? cinematography please, and please sure. directing of course always uh it's super fucking subtle um homer looks up once when john says i was born for this when he's talking about and this is the exception born to be a coal miner yeah but um the, he's always looking under the eye line after the midpoint so the aftermath of ho- Homer's father getting hospitalized and almost losing an eye. Well, and the exact midpoint is them burning and, down their shack. And that yeah. is that is literally when Homer cannot do rocket stuff. So anymore. he can no longer look above the midline. So he cannot. So the camera always makes sure that it is above him, right? Or he is looking down in scenes. And I'm pretty sure that... No he, more stars for you. You don't get to see stars. You don't yeah. get to see stars. <laughs> Look away. Uh, the only exceptions are that one time he technically looks up because he's looking at his dad when uh-huh. he returns. Uh, and um, there's a one other case, which is when he looks at Sputnik in the elevator as it descends. But I feel like that's his last... That's like intentional. Like Right, right. They got to do that for that shot. But um, it just makes him super diminutive, you know, like he's just really low. He's for, defeated. He's defeated for most of that film. Mm-hmm. So he's looking down. The camera makes him look small. And then once he starts having ideas about him, like he, uh, he confronts his father in the basement yeah. about like, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to do rocket stuff again is the first time that he looks up. Yeah. So there's a whole like chunk of act two and it's staged intentionally because he's in the basement cooper comes to the top of the stairs yeah so he has to look up past his dad to yep. go no i'm doing rockets again yep. That's so cool. directionality yeah. of eyeline is super deliberate in Neat. my opinion uh we should mention the miss riley thread um, oh yeah where because the that's another time i cried not finding out that she had inoperable cancer but when she walks away from him yeah, oh, yeah. in the hallway because he implies that, or she found out through the grapevine, I guess, that he's going into the mine. Right. And she's so disappointed that she's like, okay, I wash my hands of you, student that I tried to reach. Which, 
you shouldn't do it. Yeah, that was shit. Right. <laughs> but, like, but yeah, she also a... just found out she had an operable cancer. Is probably a fact, multifactorial true, thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then everyone's lying in the town saying that she has a new bow. Yeah, in Welsh. That's why in Welsh that that's why she She's, yeah. isn't around anymore. Well, it's that kind of town. I like that company town vibe as a setting. It reminded me of Manhattan, a show Abe and I both loved. Yeah, canceled before its time. Did you mm-hmm. see any about Manhattan? The Lost no, I didn't. project. Yeah, again, yeah, about rockets of a sort and a company town of a sort. Very, mm-hmm. very good. Yeah. Um, although it cuts off with no resolution, so we're not officially recommending it. I would. I think that's all the time I cried. <laughs> I'm obsessed with making sure everyone knows when I cry. Mm, mm. And oh, no, I just wrote, just give it up to Laura Dern's performances in Miss Riley. She's so su- like subtle. Yeah. I mean, it's a great character, and there's a lot to chew on that role. Mm-hmm. But um, there's so many people in this town that even though everything's against, like Ike. Uh, Miss Riley, Leon, Mr. Bolden. There's so many. Yeah, there's so many people who just. They have no reason to go out of their way to help Homer, and they do so much for him. Yeah, right. They get him books. They get him, you know, they cheat him welding. Yeah, you know, like they just. That's insane to their own peril, and this happens like literally after, especially in the case of Bolden, mm-hmm. like he fires a rocket at him. Yeah, at he him. has to dive out of the way. Well, that's what I was gonna say about the forest fire. Also, is just because they later find out that they that rocket didn't happen to start a forest fire, I wish they had had any scene where they say, "In the future, we have this precaution to make sure that we don't start a forest fire," because there's no reason they couldn't start a forest fire yeah they just find out they didn't and they keep firing rockets off from the same place but i guess i just felt that they just I think got it just lucky means to not shit. have started a forest they have their fire shit together and they don't yeah they're not beyond reproach but like yeah they have their shit together enough yeah but i that's what i'm saying is i think they that final moment dream away hits so hard because uh homer remembers everyone like he's so thoroughly human and a good guy like when he's giving acknowledgments at the end for the rocket he doesn't skip any like he mentions every character that you've seen help him even characters who minorly helped him and he's so thorough that you're like okay this guy remembers yeah. the place he the <laughs> and then he goes and last but and i'd also like to dedicate it to my mom and and the camera pushes in and you and know from dad. his eyes that he sees his dad and he says, my dad. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. And then they immediately hit you with Miss Riley putting her arm around one shoulder and dad on the other shoulder. Right, and you're right. like, you kidding me? And then it goes, also, dad died. Miss Riley died. Yeah, everyone. You will someday die. Yeah. Your you are going to die. are probably dead or will die soon. Yeah. <laughs> no one survives. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty intense. And that's the true message of October Sky. Right, is, is that, that life is pain. No one gets life out of this alive. Life is a circus of pain. Life is a coal mine. Well, did Werner von Braun, he created the V2, right? Or is that yeah. not Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that th- Werner von Braun is like his North Star in this, the celebrity that inspired him to want to be a rocket right. guy. And he's in and he for gets, like he sends two him fan seconds. letters. No, I'm just saying he created the rocket the Nazis used against us the most. Yeah. It's it's weird. It's a weird guy to have as your favorite guy. But uh, 50 he didn't years want. Later. Yeah, that's true. He didn't want it. Yeah. that rocket hey, to be there. Sometimes you got to separate the artist from the work and like the concept of a metal tube flying with what's in the metal tube. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like his that was not his ambition. That's just why they paid him. No, I don't think Homer ever is shown being like we should mm. fucking put some dynamite on this thing. <laughs> well, they <laughs> could do. this hurt someone? But you know they what I do mean. put like they. Think about they putting, put like, like rocket kerosene. fuel and shit in it. Well, well, but that's I in the mean, bottom. I mean, they never make a missile. They that's don't not their goal. Yeah. They want to be I spacemen. Mean, Roy yeah. Lee suggests it, and they're immediately like, "Yeah, we're just gonna blow ourselves up if we <laughs> right. do that." Great. Uh, it must have been really fun to shoot the montage of failed rockets because right. it's obviously all practical. So for days they just blew up rockets. They yeah. Fa- yeah. they made failed yeah. rockets and launched them and filmed them spiraling and exploding. And like, yeah. Don't you give me those dirty looks. Yeah. That's, that's gotta that. be fun. Oh yeah, that's the song from that yeah. montage. Yeah. Yakety yak. Yeah. <laughs> Other movie it's most notably in is it Uncle Buck? 
I think is, I would, yeah. I don't know. I, t- I haven't seen Uncle Buck for a oh, long time. Well, those, these, those two movies have so much in common, which right. we will explore Rocket in the Boys inevitable Uncle Buck, yeah. Uncle Buck yeah. episode. They're yeah. really. I feel like they're they're complementary films in that way. I think you switch Jill and Hall and Candy, and you have two better yeah. movies. They're like personally. two. They're two stars uh, in the same constellation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they really are. <laughs> It sounds like we're out of stuff to say about October Sky. I mean, it's but a really it's good Abe's film. Favorite favorite movie, so I don't want to cut him off. You got no, I mean, us? like I don't need to. I've already talked a lot. So I just can talk about this movie forever. I just love. Uh, if you've seen Captain America, mm-hmm. like Joe Johnston, because he's worked with Spielberg and he shot some of his montage work, he's like king of montage, like. When you watch October Sky's montage and think about Captain America, where he like punches Hitler a bunch of times, oh yeah, it's like it feels very cut from the same cloth. Sure, you know, because it's just he's good at this period too. Yeah, he's good at this period, like thirties to the the Rocketeer's thirties, right? Yeah, thirties or I think it's late thirties. Yeah, it has to be because there's Nazis. Yeah, so like thirties to like the fifties. Yep, pretty good. Yep. Pretty it's good. Good IMDb pretty, tidbit. Pretty good. Uh, as like, I assumed it was a joke or it scans as a joke because there's no context around it. Someone asked about Quentin and Homer Hickam called, says he's Nigerian and you think he's just like being flip. But it's true because the real Quentin's parents gave birth to him while they were in Nigeria. Mm. There you go. Weird. Very weird. That is a weird. It's a you? weird tidbit. Ooh. Yeah. Controversy arose when a porn filmmaker made a porn spoof of this film shortly after its release. That film was immediately deleted and no longer exists. I don't believe that. I bet we could find it somewhere. Right, nothing <laughs> is deleted forever. Yeah. What do you guys think the it's October Rocket Sky Blades. porn parody is called? October it's a, Sky? It's, uh, you got it. I was <laughs> like, it's pun based. What can we get here? Yeah. October Skeet. <laughs> Cocktober Skeet. There you I go. think it's Cocktober Skeet. This has been our review of Cocktober Ski, Cocktober Ski. Abe's favorite movie of all time. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks for being here. Tom. Yeah, thanks for having me. Peace out. Bye.